Transylvanian Moonrise, a secret initiation in the mysterious land of the gods. Radu Sinemar and Peter Moon The Lama was waiting for my approval which I offered without any reservation. Although excited at the thought of such a new experience for me, I confusedly felt that the physical world that we all usually consider stable and safe had now lost quite a bit of its consistency, but I could not pinpoint the cause of my feeling. Later, objectively analyzing those very special moments, I realized that although the beings and objects in the living room belonged to this world, they were equally transcending it as well. Eleanor was practically immortal compared to the average life of an ordinary human, and the object facilitating this extraordinary condition was made out of substances that had no correspondence in this world. The Tibetan priest was also a very mysterious character, and my intuition told me he possessed explosive secrets. The Yidam was an overwhelming presence that best embodied the connection with other worlds. In these circumstances, I had to adapt to make full use of all my powers and capacities of understanding. The important issue here is that because my brain was recording this bizarre information as coming to me externally, from the outside, coupled with the fact that the reality of these beings and objects were not overlapping with the common concept of daily life, a dream state was starting to generate in my mind. In fact, this was only an extreme solution of my brain in order to cope with the quandary it was in. In the beginning, I was tempted to distrust the Yidam's observation, but later, I was convinced that he was perfectly right and that his power of insight at a mental level was remarkable. On the other hand, from an occult point of view, everything was completely explainable. It is known how notably influential a waveform can be when it is manifested through the use of certain objects in order to create a magical atmosphere. This is exactly why certain props as well as special diagrams and gestures are resorted to during rituals. All of these are used in order to facilitate a breach of the separation between levels which is nothing else but a bridge between them. The energy of the one doing the magic ritual and the supporting elements that facilitate the orientation of this energy in the desired direction are the basis of any occult action. The being, as well as all the objects used, become genuine relays of caption and manifestation of certain energies belonging to the subtle planes of creation. Although we were nowhere close to being involved in a magical proceeding, the principle of the relay of force and of the energy between levels was applying, even if only because of who and what was present. For example, the subtle energetic field of the strange object that prolonged life certainly played its part in the space-time distortion that was happening in the room. The auras of the other three beings were also a major influence in this direction and such that my own aura was then somehow infused with these unusual vibrations that powerfully reverberated in my consciousness. The dream state I had entered was now suddenly invaded by a sort of voice that resembled a thunder rumble more than anything else. Although I could not actually understand the words, the idea that was transmitted was very clear. The Yidam was telling me that in order to ease and relax my mental tension, he had modified the ambience of the room, cooling it down and infusing it with vitality. My head resounded with the rumbling of his words which were reminiscent of but not really like thunder from a storm. I was trying to find an analogy, but in reality, the impression was much more complex. Pretty dazed, I managed to thank the Yidam telepathically. Suddenly, my mind and the living room became overwhelmingly quiet. There was not a sound nor movement, just a frozen silence. Peering with my eyes half ajar, the environment seemed somehow unreal. It was almost to the point where I could not feel the contours of my body. Contrary to my expectations, however, the wonderful state of relaxation that enveloped me did not make me lethargic or induce sleepiness. Instead, it made me more lucid and capable of understanding what was happening with and within myself during every moment that passed. In less than three minutes, I felt so good that I did not wish for anything else other than to remain in that very comfortable state. Intuitively, I realized that the Tibetan Lama and the Yidam were offering me this wonderful help so that I could overcome a certain mental blockage. Just prior to this new state of mind, my defense mechanism of the Gigo Fortress was very actively trying to generate a state of anguish and uncertainty in order to make me leave the room. Now, however, 
I felt an intense joy and was full of warmth and affection for being around those special people as I faced this completely extraordinary situation. After having retraced with clarity the sequence of events, discussions and inner emotions that I lived during those days, I now realize that only very few people will be willing to accept and sympathize with my experiences, even partially. In such an instance, the main issue seems to be that what I present greatly exceeds the common knowledge and conceptions about life and its hidden mysteries. I said to myself then that I can either reveal the realities I have lived during the days that followed or simply maintain silence. If I choose the latter, however, how could I possibly fulfill the recommendation I was given by the goddess I was soon to meet, Makandi, who advised me to make known to the world all the truths I have lived through? How could I still contribute, even to a small extent, to the occult knowledge of man, a knowledge that is a totally different kind from the superficial one that is experienced within the society. If it were only one or another of the aforementioned propositions I was faced with then maybe I would not have bothered to describe what had happened. There was, however, an entire series of moving facts and revelations that placed me, in a complicated and at the same time exciting game of destiny, in key situations that cannot bear comparison to normal circumstances of daily life. Surely, all these circumstances have a very precise meaning and are integrated into a much more complex ensemble than what was only partially revealed to me. On the other hand, I clearly felt that I was constantly supported and helped to successfully pass all the tests I was confronted with in this last period of my life. I believe that each one of us has a very well-determined place in the society we live in, but this does not necessarily refer to our integration into economic, political or cultural life. Nor does it refer to the idea of personal career, fame, wealth, riches, family or material gain. This role comprises a much deeper dimension of our existence, and without it, life looks dull and pointless even if it apparently has a certain attraction and exterior shine. Riches and fame are not only transient, they not durable. At most, they manage to perturb our correct understanding of the world we live in because they are tempting and illusory. Man needs something more than money, public recognition, success in business or ephemeral pleasures. If this were truly man's meaning in this world, as soon as he would achieve all these things, they should never disappear. Or, the simple fact that they are as illusory as Fata Morgana shows that the material goals of our life are nothing else but a deceiving game that eventually exhausts a being. The tumult of my later states of experience, the people I have met and the events I have participated in show me that I am on the good and luminous path of spiritual evolution. This generates a comforting feeling and an inner joy in me that accompany me always, being fully convinced that I am supported and helped to progress on the path of knowledge. I now know precisely where I need to look without being allured by false temptations. I had the extraordinary chance of meeting remarkable beings who taught and initiated me in some esoteric aspects of life, thus opening a completely new horizon over my life's understanding and integration. When I have been confronted with certain conceptual difficulties or certain disturbing facts and realities, I have always been helped to successfully overcome them. In the projection room in the Busigi Mountains, with Eleanor's revelations and especially in the presence of the Yidam, I have always received the needed help in order to successfully cope with those hiatus moments of my consciousness. The events I am describing here, however, involved a harsher reality due to the frequency of the events. During the very pleasant state I was experiencing, and then due to the combined subtle action of both the Tibetan priest and the Yidam, I was convinced that I had overcome these blockages and that I was ready to bear the eventual coming surprises much more easily. At the same time, I was amazed by the powers the Yidam had manifested towards me. I asked the Tibetan priest for further explanations in regards to this. What impressed you were actually simple acts that a Yidam can easily realize. Yet, compared to the limited capacities of the human being, these accomplishments seem special. In fact, the powers of a Yidam are much grander as he is capable of controlling certain specific energies of the universe. A Yidam must often look out for the physical and psychic integrity of a disciple. 
It is one of the undertaken responsibilities of a yidam to guide a disciple towards the final liberation in perfect safety. For the most part, a yidam's paranormal interventions are done in order to protect a disciple from being attacked by certain demonic entities or from the malefic influences he is confronted with during his spiritual practice. Such situations mostly appear in the area of Tibet which is particularly known for such manifestations. The mountainous areas, the valleys or the great expanses of plateaus are the main territories of influence of diverse subtle entities that are not always propitious to those that invade their land. They are capable of terrible action in the physical plane that can even claim the life of a disciple. These are some of the situations when a yidam is of great help. Of course, one's first intent is to obtain the benevolence of the subtle entity that governs the area where a disciple decides to settle down for a while in order to realize certain spiritual activities and practices. If not, the respective spirit could feel offended and insulted that he is not being given the required attention as the master of the place. Usually, this softening of the spirits is achieved by means of simple rituals where the reasons and the durations of the stay are presented. In order to increase the probability of success, it is common to offer a gift such as food or certain objects that are traditionally consecrated for such actions. If they are pleasing to the respective entity and are accepted, their essential subtle energy is then taken by the spirit while the material offerings are either given to other people or buried in a clean soil. If the entity refuses to collaborate, which is usually manifested as visible and averse exterior phenomena such as terrible storms, threatening lighting, stone avalanches or even harm being brought to the applicant, then the yidam intervenes and starts a fight with that entity. This confrontation can be very short if the difference in powers between the two is very big. On the other hand, if the powers of the yidam and the respective astral entity are close, the conflict can be long and tiring. During all of these, the disciple retreats from the scene of the fight, and if the situation become uncertain, he then tries to help the yidam through the means of certain spiritual practices he knows, most often invoking the additional help of other subtle entities. The situations you are describing seem like they are taken out of fairy tales or legends, I stated. I wonder if there is truly such a reality of terrible confrontations between fantasy creatures. Are these kinds of fights happening in the physical plane? I asked, curious to know. Know that they are much more real than you could ever imagine, the Lama answered. If you can't see it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. People nowadays are blind towards these subtle realities as they are very conceited and indoctrinated by materialistic ideology. That is why, even when faced with indubitable evidence of the existence of other levels being manifested, they either refuse to admit it or have a most lamentable psychic breakdown. In the subtle planes, such as the astral plane for example, the shapes and colors have a very large specter of manifestation. That's why many of the entities belonging to this dimension of creation correspond only vaguely to our representations of them in the physical plane but come very close to the so-called fabulous beings described in fairy tales, myths and legends. And, in certain very special circumstances, they can even materialize in the physical plane. Besides, this is a choice for the yidam and the respective entity and occurs only when all other possibilities of fighting and attacking in the subtle planes of existence have been exhausted. In such a case, their manifestation in the physical plane is destructive and the disciple must make sure that he hides very well. Although there are very rare cases when a yidam loses such a battle, the fight usually ends before either of the two is killed, but there are also more dramatic cases. As I contemplated the giant and silent yidam that was in the same room with us, a question gradually crystallized in my mind. Is he the yidam you created all by yourself? I finally dared to ask. The lama did not answer me straight away. I was thinking that my question was inappropriate, and I was just getting ready to apologize when he spoke in a neutral tone of voice. No. As it stands, the situation is more complicated. It is good, however, that the discussion reached this point as it is connected to the purpose of our meeting. Actually, I myself am a sort of intermediary who needs to fulfill a certain mission as far as you're concerned. Be at peace. It is all positive, however, 
I can't reveal more than is absolutely necessary right now. I was wondering how limited, necessary, was as I had been there for almost four hours but still had no idea why I had come. I then realized that although we had been talking for quite a while, I did not even know the name of the Tibetan. Ripa Sandi Somehow frustrated by this unusual situation, I expressed my perplexities which seemed justified to me. The Lama apologized for not introducing himself as yet. He then told me that he had chosen to give me certain explanations related to the presence of the Yidam first as this had consumed all of my attention. I found out that the Tibetan priest was named Ripa Sundi, that he was born in Tibet but left it after the invasion of the Chinese in 1956 as, at that time, he played an important role in the royal palace of Lhasa. He traveled for a while through several countries on diplomatic missions but eventually settled down in the capital of China, at that time named Peking. Still, something is unclear, I said. I understood that you left Tibet because of the Chinese, and now you are telling me you settled in China. Ripa Sundi had asked me to give up the formalities and call him by his name. Besides, the age difference between us was not great, but this fact created another dilemma for me. According to his narration, he was active in the capital of Tibet in 1956 which implied him being at least thirty to three five years old at that time. His present looks, however, were that of a fifty-year-old man. There was a difference of approximately four decades that was not justified. We would have gotten here anyway, to this delicate point in our talks, he said. I am glad that Eleanor spoke to you about his secret as this will make you more inclined to easily accept some of the revelations I am about to make to you. The Lama smiled slightly as he watched the strange object that was on the table. I have to tell you, he continued, that from the beginning I did not belong to the same traditional spiritual path that Eleanor follows although I know it very well. In order to understand what I do in the world and what are the goals I pursue, you would need to know some occult aspects first, but we do not now have the time for me to reveal such information. What I can tell you, however, is that I most often fulfill the role of a messenger while at the same time contribute to the successful carrying out of the transmitted message. What kind of emissary? I asked, paying a lot of attention to the discussion. And what sort of message is this about? Don't think of these messages as letters or something that can be verbally transmitted to someone, the Lama replied. Rather, the respective messages can be integrated into certain kinds of spiritual missions in various areas of the world. In relation to this, you must know that time doesn't affect me almost at all. In certain people, their level of consciousness allows them to act in such a way that they attract to their aura a certain type of cosmic energy, an energy that brings youth. Additionally, there is also a secret concoction of very rare mountainous plants and herbs which contributes to this effect, but I'll stop my explanations here. I almost did not know what to say anymore. This was going to be an unforgettable evening for sure. I then again asked Ripa Sundi who it is that sends him on such missions. The problem is complex, he answered. In order to correctly understand its subtleties, you would need a strong background of esoteric knowledge, both from an ideological and practical point of view. The one who is initiated in the mysteries of occultism knows very well that humankind is not left to its own devices. If it were so, it is possible that the negative karma of the earth would have long ago tipped the scale towards destruction. There are though, hierarchically speaking, worlds and civilizations that are meant to maintain, as much as it is possible without interfering with the free will of people, a certain balance for the entire planet. These are very delicate, complex and difficult to understand aspects of reality. On the one hand, this is due to the fact that the direction of science and humanity's conception of the universe is still too deeply materialistic. On the other hand, there are certain occult interests throughout this world which are very strong and are not at all oriented towards positive goals. What kind of worlds and civilizations are you talking about? Extraterrestrial ones? I asked, careful not to enter a slippery or unsafe subject. The Lama became serious and his voice stronger.